This video is about what does it mean to be called a saint? Hi, I'm Bake Adafi and this is Bible Study Verse by Verse. We're studying through a book of the Bible a verse at a time. This series of lessons is on the book of Romans and the New Testament. If you'd find your Bible and open it to Romans chapter 1, we'll begin in just a moment. Romans is the Bible book we're studying. This is lesson two, and we're starting with Romans chapter one and verse five. If you'd open your Bible there, you can follow along as we read. By whom, Romans chapter one, verse five, we have received grace and apostleship for the obedience to the faith among all nations, for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all that are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Verse 9, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by any means, now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you. Let's pray. Father, as we look at this portion of Scripture, we need your assistance. We need your Holy Spirit to teach us from it. We need to understand about what the calling is that you called Paul with and that you called these saints with, what it means to be a saint. We need to understand the grace and peace that he prays for them, and also his prosperous journey. Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do. We thank you for the Lord Jesus, for the give, forgiveness of our sins that's in his blood. We ask your blessing, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in verse 5, we see Paul's commission and power for office. It says, by whom, and that by whom is by the Lord Jesus Christ. The one he's just declared in the verse previous to this, who is the Son of God, declared to be so by the resurrection and the power of the resurrection from the dead. Paul's ministry came from the Lord Jesus. And he lumps himself in with the other apostles when he says, by whom, that is by the Lord Jesus, we have received grace and apostleship. He is among the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in 2 Corinthians 12, 11, that he is behind the most chiefest apostle in nothing. In nothing, he's behind the most chiefest apostle. He ranks right up there with the very best of the apostles. So what made Paul's ministry work? What was the thing that empowered it? That uh, it was the grace from God. He says, I've received grace from God and his apostleship. Acts 22, 14 and 15 says, And he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you, that you should know his will. So this is speaking of the Apostle Paul. He has been chosen by God. He's going to know God's will. Isn't that fantastic? And wouldn't you like that to happen for yourself and for me to be able to know God's will? And to see that just one, he saw the Lord Jesus, to hear the voice of his mouth, for you shall be his witness unto all men of what you've seen and heard. So he, he, understood, he knew God, he knew the Lord Jesus, he'd seen him, he'd heard the voice of his mouth, and he's going to be a witness to everybody he comes in contact with about who the Lord Jesus is. And it's going to be for obedience to the faith. Paul got his gospel directly from the Lord Jesus. He did not get it from man. Galatians 11, well, I'm great. Galatians 1, 11 through 12 says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not for man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. He received his gospel directly from the Lord Jesus, from heaven. And the other apostles received their gospel directly from the Lord Jesus when he was on earth. So we have two testimonies going on here. We have one from the apostles who were with him on earth 
and one from the apostle who was with him as he taught him from heaven for those three years when he was in Arabia after he, he was converted. Obedience here, what he's talking about, obedience for the faith means not only believing what is said, but actually doing what Jesus commands. Faith without works is dead. Paul's evangelical assignment is to the world. The Gentile world, not just the Jews. Acts 9.15 says, But the Lord said to him, Go your way, for he is a chosen vessel to me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So Paul had a broad scope of ministry. It all centered around the gospel, and it was particularly to the Gentile people, but he was going to talk to kings also, and he was going to talk to the Jews also. His was a great commission ministry. In Mark 16, 15, it says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, Paul's ministry didn't reach all the world. He, he was in the Mediterranean world. It was very localized, I guess, uh, for the civilized world at that time. That was where the civilization uh, was. But his ministry has reached the whole world because of the books he's written. He's written about half of the New Testament. And those books, anytime the Bible is given out or anytime the Bible is preached, uh, Paul speaks through the ministry that he has to all the nations. Paul had not been to Rome, so he's establishing his calling from the Lord Jesus to minister to them, and he's going to minister the gospel to them for the grace of God. Verse 6 says, Among whom you, that is the people that are, that are his audience for this letter in Rome, you are the called of Jesus Christ. The nations and the Gentiles from which God is going to uh, take a people for himself, the gospel is going to go to them. And it's gone to Rome. Somebody's taken the gospel there. Some unknown minister has gone there, and a church has been established before Paul can even get there. His audiences at Rome are the called ones of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a category which means someone who has been elected before the foundation of the world, chosen by God, and has been saved by the gospel message. God chose them before the foundation of the world. Jesus has died for them, and the Holy Spirit brings the message to life in them as it's preached with power and brings life to them. So calling can, can mean several things. First of all, it can mean just the preaching of the gospel, going out to an audience of people. It, the call goes out to everyone. The, the, the call to respond to the message that Christ died for sinners and uh, God's holy commandments and his law and uh, our sinfulness and that we must respond in repentance and faith because of what the Lord Jesus did. That calling goes out to everybody. But that calling goes out to specific people and actually saves them. It's efficacious. It works in certain people. And those are the people that have been chosen and that J Jesus died for and that the Holy Spirit brings life to. So that's the kind of calling, the second kind that we're talking about here. You see your calling. Their, their calling was one that brought life to them. By the Holy Spirit, the gospel was preached and God gave them life. That's what's happened to here. There's also a calling that goes forth when someone is called to an office. You can see Paul's calling was separated to the gospel of God. You, he's going to uh, hear the Lord Jesus, he's going to see the Lord Jesus, he's going to know who he is, and he's going to be a witness of him. So Paul had that calling. So there's three different kinds of calling. Everybody, specifically people who are saved, and then, some, and then a call to office. But these people, in particular, are called to be saints. Verse 7 says, To all that are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's verse 7. So we know that it doesn't mean everybody who's in Rome, because everybody in, who's in Rome, I mean, the, the Roman capital is full of Caesar's, Caesar and his minions and uh, a whole bunch of people that aren't saved. So he's talking to people that are saved, to all the believers in Rome, not everybody. Paul really knows a lot of people there. I mean, you can see this when we get to the end of the book in chapter 15 and 16. 
So he has um, crossed paths with a lot of them, and he knows that they're loved by God and called to be saints. Now, a saint is one who is set apart by God, who is sacred, who is holy. It's a person who's been saved. Now, there is the, the Catholic idea of a saint, somebody that has to be long dead and have some kind of miraculous things associated with them, and they're supposed to be in heaven, and they're declared, maybe they've been martyred, and they're declared to be a saint by the Catholic Church. That idea is wrong. I mean, you can see that it's wrong right here in, in the beginning of this letter because he's writing to the saints, the people that are alive there in Rome who have just trusted in Christ and who have faith in Christ and who have a faith that's, that's talked about throughout all the world. These are believers. A saint is a believer. That's, what, that's all that it means. Somebody who's been set apart by God to be holy, chosen by God. That's a, it's a standing before God. It's based on our status before God of salvation. The very newest believer who trusts in Christ and has been born again is a saint. Sainthood is a state of justification and salvation, which happens at conversion. It's not something that it's declared to be so by a church, but it's done by the God who loves us and saves us. And Paul's message to them is grace and peace. Well, this is kind of a common greeting in the scripture if you read the introductions to the, to the letters that are written there. Grace and peace, when we kind of skip over it. But um, it's really important because grace is the way that God operates in our lives. First, we receive mercy from God. That is, we don't get what we should get, which is punishment for our sin and the wrath of God upon us. And we do get his grace operating in our lives. Grace to take our next breath. Grace to, to, to do everything that we need to do to serve him. Uh, gifts of grace. Um, fruit of the Spirit is grace. Our change of heart and change of mind, that all comes to us by grace. Grace is how God, God operates in our lives. This is kind of a prayer that Paul makes. Grace and peace to you. The, 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 the grace of God extend to you and increase in you. And then he talks about peace. It's when the warfare between you and God ceases when you become a Christian. When you're saved, there's no longer a difficulty between you and God. You're not at war with Him anymore. The hostilities have ceased. You're on the same side. You're on the same team. You have a relationship with God. You can count on Him. The guilt of your sin is gone. And the punishment and the threat of punishment is gone. Grace and peace are both a blessing and a prayer by the, by the Apostle Paul for these people. They proceed from God, grace and peace do, and they are to be expected from him. Colossians 1.20 says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him, that is by the Lord Jesus, to reconcile all things to himself, by him, I say, whether they are things in earth or things in heaven. So the Lord Jesus has brought peace to us by the reconciliation between God and man. His cross, his death, his blood, all those things stand for the same thing. His substitution for us, taking the wrath of God for us so that we get to go free from the penalty of our sin. Peace is purchased for us by the Lord Jesus. And peace and grace originate in God the Father, come to us by the Lord Jesus Christ, as a gift and as a blessing. John 14, 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives peace. There's a, a, a peace of the world. When you've got enough money, you think, or when you've attained the status that you want to attain, or the car that you want to have, or the family that you want to have, or the house that you want to have, or the job that you want to have, and then you, then you have a worldly peace. This is not that kind of peace. The peace that he brings to us is peace in the midst of trials and temptations and troubles. It's an inward peace where we know we are at, not at warfare with God anymore and his grace is extended to us and he brings us through and will bring us through all the way to the end and complete our salvation. John 14, 27, Not as the world gives to you, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So the peace that we have is a heavenly peace from the Lord Jesus. And the Christians at Rome 
have a famous faith. In verse 8, it says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Well, <laughs> the, he, he's thanking God for them, for the faith that God has given them. It, he, he sees it living in them. It's spoken of throughout the whole world. That doesn't mean that people in Africa or in Asia or in, uh, in, uh, in, in Alaska or, or um, in the Americas know about the church that it's in Rome. It means the known Christian world around the Mediterranean world. Everybody that's uh, received Christ and there's churches started, everybody's heard about what's happening at Rome. This is the center of the government there. This is the center of power. This is where the king resides. And right in among all that idolatry and all that paganism and all that king worship and, and, and exists the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. They had no social media. They had no modern communications. But by word of mouth, the faith that existed in the Church of Rome has been spread all over the world. Christianity had a solid foothold there. Uh, theirs was a power of example. They had a good reputation. Plus, this praise would be a comfort to them for some of the things Peter's, uh, rather Paul is going to say later in this letter. He's giving them some, saying some good things for, to them at the beginning of the letter, and he'll have to say some hard things later on uh, in the letter. So it's uh, giving them uh, a boost about their Christianity and encourage the, encouraging them in their faith. Verse 9, Paul says he's always praying for them. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing... I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, if I by any means, verse 10, now at length I may have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you. Paul calls God as his witness about this prayer for them. He hasn't been to Rome. He wants to see them. He knows that he will be able to benefit them by his presence there. This was a wholehearted servant of the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel. And he prayed for people that he didn't even know. I mean, have you done that in your lifetime? I mean, I do it all the time. I pray for people that I don't know. The people that we visit and uh, witness the gospel to. Missionaries that I don't know, that I get letters and emails from and, and hear their reports about what's going on. I don't know them personally, but I see faith in them and I pray for them that God will bless their ministry and the gospel will go forth throughout all the world. There's a couple in Japan and there's a couple in North Korea. And, you know, there's missionaries all over the world that we need to be in prayer for that the gospel will progress by those people that are serving the Lord. You have to have a lot of faith in God who stands behind prayer to be able to pray for those you don't know. And he's praying for a prosperous journey uh, to come to them in verse 10. Making request if any means, by any means, now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you. ESV version of the Bible says, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. Here's a strange thing. Paul wants desperately to go there. And yet, these are Christians. And Paul wants to go there and preach the gospel to them and give them spiritual gifts. He has purpose to come, but was prevented so far. So he prays. Romans 1, 13 says, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purpose to come to you, but was prevented or let hitherto, that I have, might have some fruit among you, even, even as among other Gentiles. He knows that his presence there is going to benefit them. <laughs> I mean, he has that much confidence in the God who has called him to do this ministry, that he's going to uh, give them spiritual gifts, he's going to preach the gospel to them, there'll be fruit produced, people will be saved, there'll be fruit produced in their lives. It'll be that he will benefit them by going there. And he's purposed to come, but he's been prevented thus far. So this is instructive about our prayer and our purposes and our plans. It's always by the will of God. Notice that, by the will of God in the end of verse 10. This is, uh, there's a Latin 
phrase that describes this. It's Dio Valente, or abbreviated DV. And back when Christianity was more in vogue, when someone made a plan, uh, well, like the, when the king of England or queen of England made a plan to do something, and it would always say at the end, DV, uh, the initials, which means uh, that the Lord would will that this would happen. I mean, we make our plans, but it's got to be God who actually accomplishes that. We purpose to do something, but we recognize that God is sovereign over all events. James 4, 15 says, For you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. I mean, Dio Valente, if the Lord wills. That's what it's talking about. Success depends upon the will of God. God answers in his own way, and he answers in his own time. So Paul's prayer is for a prosperous journey. Dio Valente, DV. And here's God's answer. It takes up eight chapters of the book of Acts. Verses, uh, chapters 21 through 28 of the book of Acts are the answer to this prayer that Paul prays to be able to go to Rome. Now, we're not going to be able to read of all, all that. We're going to read some of them and talk about it. <laughs> Paul's trip to Rome begins in Greece, and it begins with a journey to Jerusalem. And he's taking an offering from the churches that he's collected there. Uh, uh, the church of Jerusalem is going through a hard time, and they've collected uh, for the relief of that church. Uh, they've, the church at Rome has ministered spiritual things to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles are now ministering uh, to the physical needs of the, of the church at uh, Jerusalem. So Paul goes from uh, Greece to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. He's arrested there at, at that. The Jews attempt to kill him, and he has to appeal to Caesar in Rome. And that begins a three-year journey from Jerusalem to Rome. Now, it doesn't take three years to get from Jerusalem to Rome, but there's two years he spends in prison, and he's shipwrecked and spends uh, three months recovering from that. It's a long, long time. Here's his prosperous journey <laughs> He's praying for a prosperous journey. Here's God's answer to that prosperous journey. Remember what the Lord Jesus told Paul, I will show him what great things he's going to have to suffer for my namesake. You know, as God answers our prayers, uh, it may be that we go through suffering while he's answering our prayers. So let's just read some of this. In Acts 21, verse 27 through 31, it says, and when the seven days were, were almost ended, so Paul has taken the advice of the Jews, the Christians, Jewish people, who are in Jerusalem, that the other Jews who don't believe have heard about you. They know you're talking to the Gentiles. They know you're spreading out this Christianity. Go, but prove to them that you're an okay guy. Shave your head. These people have a vow. Go in with them into the temple. So Paul does that. So his seven days of this, uh, of this vow are almost ended. The Jews which were of Asia, that's where Paul's from. He's from Tarsus in, in Asia, what we call Turkey today. When they saw him in the temple, they stirred up the people and they laid hands on him. Crying out, verse 28, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place. And further, he brought Greeks into the temple. Well, that's a no-no. No Gentiles in the temple. And has polluted this holy place. For they had seen him before, had seen before with him in the city, uh, that is in Jerusalem, Tropimus, an Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. So on their supposition, because Paul's been taking the gospel to the world, Mediterranean world, and they saw him with a the Gentile, they thought he brought that guy into the temple. And all the city was moved. I mean, the whole place is against him. They've all turned against him. Here's the beginning of his prosperous journey to go to Rome. And the people ran together, and they took Paul, and they drew him out of the temple. So they've, they've arrested him. Well, uh, the mob has got him now. And all the city was moved, and the doors of the temple was shut after they got him. And they went about to kill him, verse 31. And tidings came to the chief captain of the band. That's the Roman uh, captain who is there. Remember, 
Jerusalem and the Jews are under the thumb of Rome. They are tributaries to Rome. Rome has its garrison there. Rome has its uh, rulers there. And they, make, they, they enforce the laws. And the Jews can't do anything that Rome doesn't approve of. Well, the chief captain of the band, that, and all their, the tidings came to him, and all that were in J Jerusalem was an uproar. So this guy's going to come and, and save Paul and, and rescue him out of the hands of the Jews. And remember, there are 40 people that he, he gives his defense on the, uh, the steps up to the Roman castle, and uh, the Jews hear him all the way up to the point that he starts talking about the Gentiles, and then they to tear their clothes and throw dirt in the air and 40 of them bind themselves together that they're not going to eat until they've killed Paul. I mean, they are so serious about getting him. They just want him dead. And then the night following this, he's been arrested and uh, the Lord Jesus is going to speak to him. The night following, Acts 23, 11, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. Don't you, don't you see him arrested? People are tearing him, but why they tear him apart? They've sworn to kill him. And God says, be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified of me in Jerusalem, so you must bear witness also at Rome. So Jesus gives him this promise, this prophecy. You've testified of me here. You're also going to do it in Rome. You know, don't worry about what they're doing to you right now. So we'll skip down a little bit. Then in Acts 25, verses 10 through 12, the Romans have taken him and they want to find out what is it that these people are saying about you. And so they're going to beat it out of him. They have him strapped down and they're going to take that um, whip with all the, all the pieces of leather and little bone and metal in the end of it. And they're just going to beat him till he confesses to whatever the Jews are accusing him of. And so... Before they do this, um, they find out that Paul is a Roman citizen. <laughs> and Paul then says, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you well know. For if I'm an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if none of these things were of these accused, but but that if there is none of these things whereof these accuse, accuse me, in other words, none of these things are true, no man may deliver them to me. I appeal to Caesar. Okay, so he's before Festus at this point, uh, the governor Festus. And he confers with the council and answered, you've appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. So po politics comes into this. Paul's citizenship as a Roman citizen. He was born in Tarsus wasn't born he was raised and brought up at the feet of Gamiel and taught the law in Jerusalem but his citizenship is Roman and that Roman citizenship saves him that's one of the things that sends him on his way I mean besides the fact that the Lord Jesus has planned this and that's the way it's going to happen because he says it's going to happen that way be of good cheer Paul you testified in Jerusalem you're also going to testify in Rome about me but his appeal to Caesar is the thing that starts him on this journey it's about three years before he gets to Rome. He spends two years at Caesarea. He's giving his defense before kings and rulers. They trot him out every time somebody comes in and they show him off and have him tell them why he's there. And he spends two years doing that. And another year of a disastrous journey at sea with a shipwreck and, and, um, and, and months of recovery from that. So then in Acts 27, verse 20 through 25, uh, they're at sea. They've, they've set off. Paul said, don't go on this journey. It's not going to work out well. They don't pay any attention to him. They go on the journey. The, there's a storm. Everybody is dis, despaired that they're going to lose their lives. They've thrown everything overboard. They're trying everything they can think of, and nothing's working. They can't see the sun. They can't see the stars. There's no way to guide them. They don't know where they are. That's the situation that they're in here. It says in Acts 27, 20 through 25, And when neither sun nor stars in many days, many days they're out there, and this has happened, did appear, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. So um, they've lost all hope. Uh, there's 276 people aboard this ship are sure that they're all going to die. Verse 21 of Acts 
27, and after a long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, <laughs> you know, he's going to tell them, you should have listened to me. I, I told you this was going to happen. You should have hearkened to me and not have loosed from Crete and not to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no, there shall be no loss of, of any man's life among you, but of the ship. The ship's going to be crashed. The ship's going to be lost. Everyone's going to be saved. How does he know this? Well, Jesus is talking to him and telling him. For there stood by me this night an angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, you must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God has given you all those who sail with you. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. I believe God that it shall be even as it was told to me. So he's making a prophecy. The ship's going to be lost. Everyone will be saved. You know, be of good cheer. Well, <laughs> they believe him. At least the the the, uh, the centurion, the, the person in charge, believes him. And then in Acts 27, 31, 32, and then 37. So the sailors have decided they're going to abandon the boat and they're going to put down the lifeboat and they're going to leave and let everybody else crash. So Paul says to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these, the sailors, abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let it fall off. And we were in all the ship, 203 score and 16 souls. Then in Acts 27, 41 through 44, and falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the fore part struck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken by the violence of the waves. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners. So they don't want anybody, uh, if, the, if the prisoners escape, they're going to have to give, forfeit their lives. They, don't want, they want to kill the prisoners so nobody gets away. Kill the prisoners lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to the land, and then the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they all escaped safe to land. That is Paul's prosperous journey on his way to Rome from Jerusalem. That's what he prayed for. Listen, Christian, when you're praying for things, don't expect it to happen just like you would want it to happen. Things God may have a different plan in mind for you. The, the end result may be what you've prayed for, but the intermediary steps may seem terrible to you. It may seem like persecutions and trials and tribulations, just like it happened to God's premier apostle here as he was on his way to Rome. This was God's answer to Paul's prayer to go to Rome. Paul ministered to all nations. The Romans were called saints. They had a famous faith. And Paul got there, but he got there as a prisoner and he got there in chains. And if you know the book of Acts, you understand that he spent two years there. He had to hire a house. He had the soldier chained to him and he received everybody that came to him. He wrote letters that we have in the Bible from there. Just an amazing person and an amazing answer to his prayer. Well, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the calling that you give each soul that's saved. We're called to be saints. We're called to be set apart to you, to be holy. Lord, thank you for the Holy Spirit that makes, it, makes the message of the gospel live in our hearts and souls, that we can trust the Lord Jesus Christ and commit ourselves to him. Lord, help us to have a faith that other people see and uh, find remarkable in the midst of our circumstances. Help us as we pray to understand that your ways are not ours and that your ways are higher than our ways and that you may answer in your own time and, in, and by your own purpose. Lord, give us faith in the Lord Jesus. Help us to trust him. Help us to understand as we go forward in the book of Romans what your will is and, and your gospel. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching. In the next lesson, Lesson 3, we'll begin with Romans chapter 1 and verse 11. I hope the Lord blesses you as you study His Word. If you have questions or comments about this lesson, you can email me at all one word, Bible study 
v by v at gmail.com. And please don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more Bible study, verse by verse. Mm -hmm.